Thank you very much for staying on the marketplace. Welcome back now to our very first story. The 2017 budget is set to introduce drastic measures to increase revenue for government expenditure plans this year. Some of these measures, which will be announced by Finance Minister Ken Okoriata tomorrow, Thursday, will result in some laws being reviewed to change the way revenue is allocated to various sectors of the economy. George Ruafi has more. For some, the 2017 budget can be described as radical because of measures that it would introduce to make room for government to fund some of its campaign promises. It will also try to correct the rigidity that has been associated with the budget and make it more flexible so that the finance minister can have options to spend in areas that can be described as critical to the economy. On the revenue side, the finance minister, Ken Furiata, is expected to announce that government will abolish the special import levy, remove VATs on selected medicines that are not produced in the country. The 17.5% tax on domestic airline fares will also go off. VATs on real estate will also be removed. The 17.5% tax on financial service will be abolished. Some import duties on raw materials and machinery that are produced within the ECOWAS region would also go off. Government is expected to review the tax exemptions granted to businesses and also look at the possible sale of government's interest in some state-owned institutions. All of these measures could result in some significant boost in revenue, according to persons with some knowledge of the 2017 budget. On the expenditure side, government will look at the realigning of earmark funds and introduce some measures that would improve the fiscal space. All these interventions will ensure that the Let's now get the views of some members of parliament on that particular uh, budget presentation, the 2017 budget presentation. The only challenge we are having is that I foresee this administration cutting down on statutory payments. You know, that will be creating artificial money. When you say creating artificial money, what it simply means is that Get Fund is supposed to have one billion. You don't give them one billion, so you keep 400 million, give them 600 million, so you have some mil uh, 400 million with government centralized to spend. It is not additional money that has come in. It still works up to the same amount of money. Or uh, what do you call it? Uh, common fund, uh, you reduce it to 5% instead of 7.5%, then you keep the 2.5%. It is not additional money. But we know that on the ground, Ghanaians had a reason for instituting these uh, policies. Because the district assemblies are starving of resources. And that is where the action is. The local government system is where you can drive change. To the extent that we're promised that because they don't have adequate resources, they needed to be sent one more million per any constituency that you have. So to take that money away from them and give it back in another form of one million dollars will not be the promise that we, we had. The promise that we had is that in addition to the 7.5%, because you are under-resourced, if you have one constituency in the, in the district, you'll get one million dollars. If you have two constituencies, you get two million dollars. So Borga Central or Borga Municipality, we are expecting two million dollars. That is a lot of money, and that will change a lot of things, in addition to the 7.5%. So we don't want this engineering that doesn't add to the value or that doesn't add additional revenue, but that merely... Uh, you know, twist around and move figures in order to give the central government a lot of money to spend when the actual institutions mandated to spend the money don't have it. Because we have come a long way by making sure that central government doesn't control expenditures. We have come a way of evolving to the extent that we expect the local actors to have the resources and to deliver development at the constituencies and at the, at, at the districts. And so when we have a budget that uh, tries to create excuses in order to... In my kind of opinion, I expect that uh, the budget is going to uh, be the budget of hope for all Ghanaians, in the sense that uh, the, the, the manifesto that our party presented in 2016, that the people bought into by giving us their mandate, is clearly going to uh, feature in the, in the budget that is going to be presented. And for sure, it's going to create a lot of opportunities for uh, every Ghanaian. The mass unemployed youth 
who have completed various institutions and uh, hither to added the lack of job for the previous administration uh, idling around who now have the hope that uh, within a shorter possible time they'll all be absorbed in various sectors of our uh, uh, economy and I think uh, it's going to give a lot of hope for uh, the youth and particularly uh, the business uh, community because the budget too has a component that will boost the private sector and uh, our government is going to encourage private uh, uh, partnership. I think that the MPP promised us that when they come to power we wouldn't have load shed. They were categorical about that. They also promised us that when they come they will scrap the energy sector levy and also scrap VAT on electricity. Tomorrow next I'm told the Minister of Finance will be presenting the budget. If the Minister of Finance redeems the promise of the MPP by scrapping VAT and also scrapping the energy sector level. I promise you I shall walk from here on my foot to the flag staff to congratulate President Akufado. Let them redeem their promises. You don't see Let that happening. You promises. don't see that happening. I've thrown a challenge. Let them redeem that promise and I shall walk here from parliament barefooted to the flag staff to congratulate President Akufado. If they scrap VAT on electricity sales and if they scrap the 10% energy sector level, I promise you and I shall live to that. Away from that, the new Ghana 5 CD note is set to be issued by the Bank of Ghana next Tuesday. The note is being introduced as part of the Bank of Ghana's 60th anniversary celebration, which falls on March 4. The commemorative note will have fresh security features and a new portrait at the front and back, with additional features that are sensitive to aid the visually impaired. Edward Mose is head of issue at the Central Bank. On the 3rd of March, which is this coming Friday, the governor of the Central Bank of Ghana, Dr. Abdul Nashir Zahaku, will meet the press and the deposit money banks, as well as some select financial institution representatives to unveil the five city banknote and then give the public a foretaste of how this note will look like before it is rolled out to the public on the business day of 7th of March 2017, which is a Tuesday. I believe you all know that 6th of March is a, uh, our Independence Day, and as such, it's a public holiday. So there will be no banking services on that day. So 7th of March, across the country, this note will be unveiled mm. to the public. Well, at least that now we can, I, I look at the, the backdrop in this office and I, I get a fair idea about what the five Ghana cities in terms of the basics uh, being on the, on the front and the back, uh, having some critical uh, national landmarks on it and all those things. Uh, how is this five Ghana city commemorative note going to look like in terms of those uh, significant portraits that always comes along with every currency or notes that they issue? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as you may well know, the, what we are seeing at the backdrop is the existing five Ghana City notes that has the portrait of the big six. Now, what is coming out on the 4th of March is not going to be like this, even though in terms of colors and other f features, they, there may be similarities, but there will also be a significant departure in terms of the upgrade of uh, security features including the uh, public uh, security features that will be introduced. But then uh, the portraits on that note will be an individual portrait, and it's not going to be the big six. And then at the reverse, there will also be changes at the reverse to signify our current economic uh, system and structure. Let's now get into the energy sector where energy analyst Kwejo Poku says Ghanaians must be told that NDC government soul is solely responsible for the country's return to darkness in the future. Explaining the previous government's inability to tell Ghanaians the truth about the power situation has degenerated into the current state of affairs. Report on how much we owe as a country was as a result of the NDC running the country on crude oil. To give Ghanaians a seemingly feel that we have 
enough resources to power. I have said numerous times that if 2016 was it an election year, would we have been running the country on crude oil when clearly there are some issues that we could have easily tell Ghanaians that, look, like what happened this week? It was a week of lights going off. Though we were not given the information ahead of time, which right. would have been appropriate if we did, right. but the country, the government did not go and borrow money and go and bring in crude oil. Anytime we power crude oil, we all know how much we are paying as a nation. Right. We are paying as residential customers, me and you, are paying nine cents. That's if you don't have any subsidies. Right. Those with the lifeline customers, they are even paying what they pay is much, much less. Right. But per kilowatt hour, is 30 is 34 pence okay sorry 34 pesos okay which is about nine cents if you use four to the dollar right if the generation company the ppa they signed is 13 cents right. it means that every time there's a clue what R, there is a four cents deficit which somebody has to pay for. pay for if we use crude oil crude oil is 26 cents per kilowatt hour Okay, so the nine expensive. cents, it's 17 cents that somebody Needs has to, to pay, pay for. Who is the somebody? Okay. Who is government? It's me and you. Right. So you see, if you are now putting up, running the country on crude oil, it sums out to be about over $110 million a day. All right. So if you run this country on crude oil, for residential, I'm not even adding industries and other non-residential. I'm just using residential figures. Right. As per the Energy Commission um, statistics for 2015, because right. 2016 figures are not really accurate yet, you are spending for residential only over 110 million every day. So how are we surprised that there's a debt of 2.4 billion? Right. And as Ghanaians, we have to really sit back and ask ourselves: It doesn't matter what promise Nanadu made. It doesn't matter what promise anybody made. So NDC government has, I mean, is justified to justified. say that they are not, they are not the reason why. Well, we they, are the reason. To they are the reason. They are the reason because basically they piled up the debt. In in trying to please Ghanaians, they piled up the debt. If they have stuck to their word that in election year they will not succumb to government pressure or uh, to the populist pressure. Look, January first, twenty sixteen, there was a price of electricity. Yes, it was expensive, everybody complained, but guess what? It was the realistic price of electricity to pay. Right. Government succumbed. In July, there was a reduction, a reversal, and the debt keep piling. Today, whether it's 2.4, whether it's 1.4, somebody has to pay. All right, so Kojopoku, who was speaking with Aisha Ibrahim on the big story yesterday, also challenged uh, the former deputy power minister, John Ginapo's uh, figures of $1.3 billion uh, of, for the energy sector debt and insisting that the $2.4 billion quoted by the president during his State of the Nation address is accurate. On, on authority, that that amount he's quoting is as of August. As at so August. It's an August figure that was given to the World Bank. Okay. Okay. So, so minus, uh, uh, minus what so August, today? Uh, August, September, October, October November, November, December. Okay. Okay. So that's an authority that look the figure he has is a figure to as August. As at August, it was one point three. But like I said, we've run the country on crude oil, and not only are we running on crude oil, all the MDCs, all the MDAs, and the SOEs are not paying their bill. Right. So there are various areas that even as we speak, six weeks into the new administration, we have not put the prepaid meters where we're supposed to put them. The SOEs and the MDAs are still putting up these costs. So the cost from the 2.4 billion mm. now is no longer 2.4 billion. Right. When we are to go and do the audit now, I can assure you that it has increased. So until something is done immediately to ring fence and stop the incurring of costs, you can come and say, look, it's 1.3. This person can say it's 2.4. Whether there was a swallow by Jonah to the whale or the whale swallowed Jonah, there was a swallow. There is a debt that we have to look out for as a country. How do we pay for it? Let's not play for it. It's a live on the marketplace right here on Joy News. Moving on, IT professional Bernard Ofori's career path took a different turn after a visit to Nigeria. If you have been to Nigeria before, you would have realized that catfish is a popular delicacy uh, over there. Well, Bernard decided to test the market for catfish in Ghana and it appears to be paying off. He'll be sharing his story on the business life this evening on the Joy Business Brand. Let's get some tea. Yeah.
Bernard Ofori is lighting up the charcoal grill. It's 4 p.m. and his work has begun. Bamboo Gardens, located at Abilengpe in Accra, Bernard operates the catfish grill, a business concept he developed when he visited Nigeria. Um, actually, part of it was I I eat a lot of fish, so I came back and I was eating tilapia maybe three, four times a week. Now, what I realized was I got to a stage where I got fed up of tilapia and I wanted a change, and I couldn't find this anywhere. So I was thinking, if I like it, I'm sure a lot of people too will like it. And I couldn't find it anywhere else. Not the way I like it anyway. So I thought, maybe there's an opportunity here. So I actually went back to Nigeria to learn how they prepare it. Last year, Bernard decided to test the business in Ghana. But you'd wonder why a successful IT professional would even bother to start a business like this one. All right, so you make a date for the full story on Business Life tonight at 5 p.m. Moving on, one major setback depriving small-scale businesses from having access to foreign markets and from bidding for contracts with multinationals is a lack of adequate capacity. This is also one of the reasons why local businesses cannot thrive in a competitive market. These came up during a training workshop for small-scale businesses organized by Invest Africa and Africa Partner Pool, APP. In an interview with Joy Business, the manager for Africa Partner Pool, Ibrahim Aminu, also emphasized the importance of building appropriate skills. The private sector said to be the engine of growth for the economy is yet to occupy its rightful place within the economy in Ghana. This is because small-scale enterprises, which forms a major component of the private sector, do not have what it takes to remain competitive. The sector is therefore losing out on gains to foreign competitors. This is what necessitated the training workshop put together by the Africa Partner Pool, an online market which connects foreign businesses to various sectors of the economy and with the local businesses. The manager of APP, Ibrahim Aminu, indicated that Guardian businesses were losing out on contracts due to inadequate skill set. It's very important that we understand that a lot of the, the time foreign companies are winning these deals because they have this technical expertise and we lack that. We have the desire, we want to, but we don't have the skills and no one's going to give you a contract if you can't deliver. Everybody wants delivery at the, at the lowest possible cost, so it's always important for you to make sure that you empower people with the right skills, you put them through programs where they can develop their skills in order for them to then be able to be competitive. The workshop sought to enlighten business owners on right business practices as well as facilitating information sharing. Some participants spoke with Joy Business. Locally, we need a lot of training to be able to meet the uh, international standards, especially in the area of garment. It's just not about scale. It's not about the numbers, it's also about the kind of machinery that you need, the kind of specifications that they need. These are things that we, we have to learn a little bit more. I think one of our major challenges is um, funding. Especially, you're talking about 28 to 30 percent, sometimes even 35 interest rate and it's scaling. Businesses in Ghana who register as APP suppliers get the chance to display their products and services to a range of international and domestic buyers. Now, let's turn our attention to some business development story in the Volta region where residents of the Agotime traditional area, a Kinti production hub in the Agotime Geofe district of the Volta region, have launched an initiative to commercialize production of the woven cloth in the area. This will see the establishment of a Kinti village to serve as a one-stop center for Kinte designing production and marketing. The Volta Regional Minister um, Archibald Letter cut the sword for commencement of the project. Kente weaving is a major source of livelihood in the Agotime traditional area, with over 2,000 residents engaged in the trade. The business hasn't, however, blossomed into the anticipated industry due to lack of market channels. The initiative is therefore expected to create a channel 
to market Agotime produce kente to the outside world. It is expected to cost 2.4 million cities and would be financed with funds from kente festival celebrations. The Volta Regional Minister Achibad Lecha indicated establishment of the Kente village when implemented effectively would contribute to raise the income level of residents. Each one completed can be linked to many marketing platforms, both local and international. It is a cause that should be vigorously pursued to connect Agotime to the rest of the world. Togbeo, Mamao, my brothers and sisters, our low level of business ethics needs to change. The many business opportunities associated with the Kente and tourism industry are huge. The time has come for a paradigm shift and the need to bold for bold initiatives. The corner of Agotime traditional area, Nene Nwe Keteku III said, though the initiative was captured in the 2014 national budget, the Eswal Mahama government failed to see it through. Today, much an important milestone in our marketing, our cultural heritage, and opening up Agotime and in that matter, the Volta region for tourism investment. The Kente village project is a deliberate effort by the people of Agotime to project the Volta region and for that matter, Ghana as a prepared destination for eco tourism. This project has been on the drawing board for a considerable period. And in fact, it was started in the 2014 national budget of Ghana. When fully completed, it would house a gallery, an office, an ICT lab, lockable stores, a restaurant, a conference hall, and an academy to train individuals in kente weaving. The first phase of the project is expected to be completed after 12 months. Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. Let's now cross over for some international updates in Nigeria, West Africa, where reports say following continuous increase in its production capacity, foremost cement manufacturer Dangote Cement PLC has finally ended the era of Nigeria's dependence on importation as the company exported 0.4 million tons of the product to other countries in 2016. There's more in this report. In its 2016 full-year audited results presented on the floor of the Nigerian Stock Exchange in Lagos on Monday, Dangote Cement sold 8.6 million metric tons of cement outside Nigeria, which is 54% more than what was sold in 2015. Reports say the export is significant given that the nation used to be a net importer of cement. As of 2011, Nigeria was one of the world's largest importers of cement, buying 5.1 million metric tons of foreign cement at huge expense to the country's balance of payments. The company's Pan-African cement plants continue to perform well, contributing significantly to its turnover and profitability. Despite the economic challenges, Dangote Cement achieved sales and revenue growth of 25% and consolidated its position as Africa's leading producer of cement. And on that note, we end this afternoon's edition of The Marketplace. It's been fun having you around, and I hope you also enjoy the program. Let's meet again same time tomorrow for more interesting developments in the world of business. My name is Emmanuel Abouaji. Have a great afternoon.